Oh, Nishan, thank you so much. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, do I, uh, how, how am I gonna do the slide? So this is, is- So if you just start your slideshow, it should go. Is that okay? Can you all see that? Yes. yes? Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, during these uh, times, it's been uh, difficult, but actually also fun. Uh, um, getting involved with online education. And um, I think uh, what you did, um, Nishant, has been terrific. Uh, I was curious how it played out over the months. I mean, during the, the really upheaval time when everyone was home, it was incredibly important. And I'm glad to see people are still interested. And what I'd like to do tonight is go through just some maneuvers in the lab to help one understand uh, a supraventricular tachycardia in the lab. And I have a very organized approach, as I think most people know have heard me before. It's not the only approach, and I'm not going to sell it as the only approach, but you need an approach. I think people who go into the lab, especially younger EPs, and they just start, they start getting into a rut of saying, I think it's this, and they go down that rabbit hole. So I'd like to present you what I would hope you'll do uh, is to think through each case in the lab. And I will tell you, when I go through the maneuvers I'm going to show you, I do this with every case, even though I've done thousands and thousands of PSPTs in the lab and in the OR in my career, every case, I, is a, especially with the fellows, is a bit of a teaching case and to go through a um, organized approach. So uh, kind of a, for EPs, this is pretty simple, differential of SVT, but it does come back to how you'll do maneuvers in the lab. So it's either AV node independent, which means you don't need the AV node for maintenance of the circuit, uh, or AV node dependent, which means you do need the AV node. And I've only shown you the most, the typical ones in there, but you know, obviously AFib, a flutter, they're, they're AV node independent. But I would tell you, if you're an electrophysiology trainee uh, or even junior attending, uh, and you don't know how to differentiate atrial flutter and FIB from everything else, um, this is probably not the lecture for you. I think you have to go back and learn general cardiology. So I'm kind of half kidding, but that's why I don't have those up there. So let's go through an approach. Um, uh, and um, sinus node reentry is one of the things you may see in the lab, but that's pretty, pretty simple, right? It's a high low rhythm and you won't ever have to worry about that being AV node reentry. And the reason I use AV node reentry as my default rhythm is because if you do thousands of cases, you'll find that just add up the numbers, AV node reentry is the most common PSPT that you'll deal with in the lab. So I always go in with a case saying it's AV node reentry to proven otherwise, and then it's up to me to figure all that out. So sinus node reentry is obvious, it's high-low. And by the way, an atrial pack that's high-low is obviously not going to be AV node reentry. So then what I like to do is say, okay, atrial tachycardia is one potential mechanism. Now, I can either eliminate that by ruling out atrial involvement. So if I terminate a tachycardia from the ventricle, that doesn't go back to the A, and I can do that reproducibly, uh, I've eliminated atrial tach. If during tachycardia, for some reason, atrial impulses drop out, and that can happen, for example, with AV node reentry, obviously it's not atrial tach. And then we'll go through some of this entrainment stuff. And it's, it's actually not technically entrainment, but it's called entrainment when you paste the V and look for these VAV responses. And some of this will be near and dear to Dr. Bradley Knight. So this is just, a, 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 I'll go, you'll see this figure later for a different reason, but here you can see there's a PSVT going on. It's a long RP tachycardia, which means there's a short PR and a long R to P. A PVC is introduced in the ventricle at a time the hiss is refractory and terminates tachycardia. And if that's a reproducible event, you'll never have this being due to atrial tach. For those who you're sharp and you realize it obviously nails down AV reentry is the mechanism, but we'll come back to that later. But still, if you can PVC at a time when the hiss is refractory, and you can see that here, terminate tachycardia without an A, it's not atrial tach. And then you'll do this maneuver, and this is the one that's near and dear to old Dr. Knight, or should I say not so old Dr. Knight. And, and it's not really entrainment. I mean, you can make it entrainment if you want to do multiple cycle lengths, but, but it's called atrial entrainment. Um, what happens is you're in the middle of a tachycardia, you pace the ventricle, and if you get what's called a VAV response, that can be either due to pacing the V going up an accessory pathway and turning around and coming back, so it's a VAV, or 
dissociating the, the circuit in the AV node in the V up to the A, turning around, come down and back to the V. And this is interesting, you know, um, for those of you who are younger, you, you probably don't understand how interesting this is to some of the old timers. When I started out in the field, there was, there was no thought that this could happen because AV node reentry was felt to be intranodal. Uh, we now know that's not true. So when it's intranodal, you would not be able to do this theoretically. Anytime you capture the, H, the AB node, you'd extinguish the tachycardia. The first time I was aware that this wasn't, that wasn't intranodal was during my early work, with, which I'll go over, just show you a slide of PVCs during, uh, a, during uh, AV reentry, looking for sites of pathways. That's the pre-excitation index. But during that study, we had some AV node reentries in there. And we were able to do this. And honestly, for me, it was a bit of a revelation because I realized that, wait a second, if I did this, it can't be all intranodals. But that was the earlier thinking. So either one of these are a VAV response, and they would basically rule out an atrial tach. Here's just an example of a VAV. Here's a person who has tachycardia going on here. It's an AV node reentry, cycle length 316. You should start with pacing cycle length about 10 to 20 milliseconds faster than the, than the tachycardia cycle length. You don't want to go too fast because you can terminate tachycardia. And at some point, you'll capture the A, and you have to be careful to make the right measurements. So here's the last pacing cycle length at 300. And indeed, we're left here with an AA interval, which is 300. And then you come back with, with the next interval. So you have a VA come down to a hiss and a V. And you can also make use of other things. So the, this V to A here during pacing with the captured beat is very long versus the V to A during tachycardia. And that's pretty much exclusively something that occurs with AV node reentry, not AV reentry. So you can use all these data to help you get quickly to a diagnosis. Uh, here's another example of a VAV response, but this is one that's with an accessory pathway. So during tachycardia, we captured the tachycardia circuit. So you can see this is the last captured V. You can see this is the interval here. And then you come back with a V to A to V. Some people like to say V, A, His, V, but it's just too many words for me. And then you measure this V, A, and this V, A interval is not too different than this one, maybe 50 to 70 milliseconds different. So you have to make use of all your data with the maneuver. So one maneuver can nail it all down for you if you, are, you stop, you think, and you make all the measurements. So how does that happen? Well, this is obviously a cartoon. It's, this is not the AV no reentry circuit, but it's a cartoon to explain the fact that the V is not part of the circuit. So an AV no reentry, at some point it goes down and comes back up in you know, slow, fast form, right? So when you pace the V, you are really doing something very different in this situation. You are now totally going up you, in this situation to fast, but you go from the V to the hiss to the AV node over the fast back to the atrium. This takes a lot of time to get there versus this artificial VA. This is not really a VA, it's just a measurement of a VA. And so therefore, if you get the VAV and you measure this V to A here and you compare it with this one, and if it's greater than 100 milliseconds, in my own experience, that only occurs with AV node reentry. And we actually looked at this many years ago. It's actually, it's in our first textbook. We just described uh, this kind of uh, these numbers. But that's not true for the funny kind of tachycardias. The, mid, the like long RP tachycardias, these rules break down. George Klein's group wrote a nice paper on that years ago. So the rules I'm telling you about the delta VAs, in other words, that 100 millisecond rule, is pretty solid for the slow fast forms or even the intermediate forms of AV no reentry. But the really long VAs, you can have an accessory pathway with slow conduction also have a delta of greater than 100. So you have to be careful there. But there are other ways to figure out a long RP, and we'll go over those. Now, let's come back to one of my favorite articles. And if you all haven't read this, you need to read this. This is one. Of, this is the first first journal article I go over. This is always my July journal club with my trainees because I want them to understand how the heart is activated. And this paper from Dirk Dorr is still a classic in my opinion. I've personally read it probably 50 times. 
this is figure three, which is my favorite figure from the paper. These were a group of uh, human hearts that were, uh, people died like from a motorcycle accident. And they actually studied them with plunge electrodes and they, and they looked at the total excitation of the heart. That's, that's the name of the paper. Uh, beautiful figures in color. And what I'm showing you here, I want you to understand transeptal conduction times. Forget the activation here. I don't want to go through that now, but transeptal conduction times are anywhere from 40 to 60 milliseconds in humans. You can see this is the right ventricle. Here's the septum. This is like a heart opened up, so you'd have to close this. This is like a door here. This closes over to here, and so it's just kind of split down here. But you can see the transeptal conduction time, 40 to 60 milliseconds. So why is that so important? Well, it's the actual data I use to uh, develop with George Klein, the pre-excitation index. And I'll go through that in a moment, but you can see why these things work. Why, if you measure, if you remember, most of us during uh, pacing maneuvers or in the RV apex, you can also be toward the outflow track, but you know, usually your catheter is sitting somewhere down here. So imagine then if you had an accessory pathway in the septum or on the right side of the heart, then you're not far from the circuit, right? So if a, pa a patient has a tachycardia, it comes down, you're not that far, you capture the circuit and you measure the VA during pacing and during the circuit, you're sort of close to the circuit. But if you have to get over to the left free wall here somewhere, then you have to go transeptal, somehow get in that circuit and get over there. And that's what these numbers are based on. So in the grouping that you would still call a VAV less than 100, okay, a VAV less than 100, I mean, sorry, a V paste minus a V during tachycardia of less than 100. That can be broken down further in the lab to really hone in on where a pathway is. So this schematic shows you a right free wall pathway, but it could also be in the septum. And here's your circuit and you're pacing here and you're not that far from the circuit. So your VA interval during pacing might be the same. And in fact, I'll give you a little clue, sometimes shorter, shorter than the VA interval during tachycardia. Now think about that. If your VA interval during pacing is shorter than the VA during the circuit, then you're, you're clearly going to have to be a right free wall, right? Because you have to be actually closer to the circuit where you're pacing than if you came down the normal system. And so that's always a, a patient with a right free wall. But you can see how these will be close together. In our experience, if your VA interval is less than 50 milliseconds, when you do the, the subtraction, VA during tachycardia versus VA uh, during pacing is 40, 30, 20 milliseconds, you're always on the right side of the heart. If it's greater than 70, and it's not one of these funny pathways, you usually are on the left, but it's all based on the fact of transeptal conduction and getting into the circuit. So it's all based on known physiology. Atrial tachycardias will give you, if you capture them, and sometimes you can't even capture them, if you can capture a circuit, you get a, what's called a VAAV response. So what's happening? You're, the circuit's up here in the atrium somewhere. You paste the ventricle and then you capture the circuit. You're not necessarily in training, you've captured the circuit. And then you come around, okay? So that's your V and that's your A. But you have another A comes out and then you come down to the V. So a VAAV response is typical for an atrial tachycardia. And here's such an example. You can see here's the high RA. It's actually a little earlier than the HIS. CSs are not on in this patient. Um, and you can see during tachycardia, we suddenly, with pacing the V, we capture the A, and you can see that here, all right? So you capture, the, here's your last capture. This interval's longer, so this is the spontaneous one coming down. So you have a V, A, A, V. That's atrial tachycardia. Now, you've gotta be careful, and you can't be an eyeballer. You've gotta measure. Uh, People have heard me use this before, but I always feel in the ablation lab that you have to act like a carpenter. You have to measure twice and cut once. I have never been a fan of learning uh, during ablation. Um, some people do that and I think it's foolish. I think you nail it down exactly what's going on and then you turn on the energy. So this is an eyeball VAAV, but the problem here is you haven't measured right. If you actually look at the pacing cycle length 290, you'll see you were off a beat. 
This is actually the last captured A. This is a long VA tachycardia. And so this is the last one. This is the return cycle. So it's really, a, it's not a VAAV. It's an eyeball VAAV, but it's not a true VAAV. And um, since I'm no longer on the boards, I can only tell you when I was on the boards and Brad can tell me if he's still on. I know for a while he was chairing it. I don't know if he gave up or if he's still on the boards, he can tell us later. But this was a typical kind of a question we put on, not trying to fool a candidate, but to make sure you understood the physiology. Because this is not about eyeballing things, it's making the right measurement. So you have to always measure the interval and see what the last captured beat is. And it's no different than looking at this when you're, you're doing uh, entrainment mapping, like in VT, looking for the isthmus and the PPI and all that. But it's just basic physiology of pacing maneuvers. So here's the now return one. This is really the last captured. This is really a VAV. So make your measurements, please. Okay, so now you've gone through and said, all right, I was not able to get the, um, I couldn't get termination of the tachycardia uh, with the um, pacing the V. And you know, for whatever reason, I just couldn't even get, get the capture of the A during pacing and that can happen sometimes. And so there's another way you could do it. You'd say, all right, I can also rule out atrial tach if I rule in AV node involvement. Once I've ruled in AV node involvement, Poof, atrial tax out of the ball game. And that's really simple to do. And that's actually easier than the one I showed you. Any changes in the AH interval that precede and predict subsequent A to A changes tells you AV nodes part of the circuit. And by the way, this is important to use in uh, defibrillator work. It's often difficult. Uh, I mean, people have difficulty at times when they have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, in, the, um, um, in, in a defibrillator attack according where you have an A and a V. And is it, is it the A driving the V or the V driving the A? And if there's any wobble in the circuit, you get a little wobble in the circuit, measure the VVs and the AAs. If the AAs are running the VVs, then it's not VT. You don't necessarily know the mechanism of SVT, but it's not VT. If the VVs are, are driving the As, it's not necessarily VT though. That could also be an SVT. So what you want to look at there is if the AA intervals change and cause the Vs to change, then at least you know that episode's not VT. So you can make use of the same rules even when you're not in the lab. Variable AHs with a fixed HA tells you the AV nodes involved. And PVCs that start tachycardia with a VAV response, that's obviously telling you the AV nodes involved. And there's a whole bunch of other things here that are suggested, but not necessarily 100%. And these are easy to do in the lab. You just have to keep inducing tachycardia a bunch of times. You will typically see wobble in the first three to five beats. We actually looked at that years ago. Uh, unless you have alternands, like cycle length alternands, usually by the third to fifth beat of any kind of tachycardia, you stabilize out. So the places to look for wobble are when you initiate or when it terminates. That's when you often have some cycle length changes. And once you have a cycle length change, you can see who, what drives which. So in this case here, we start tachycardia, it'll settle in over here, but initially you'll see there's a little wobble. This, and it's, again, you know, you may only be 20, 30 milliseconds, but measure carefully, you'll get an answer. This change in the AH interval here causes a change here. And you can just measure the his hisses. That's an easy way to do it. So 324, 324, this AH comes in, which brings the HH in and the subsequent AAs in. And through it all, the H to A stays constant. This is AV node dependent, 100%. And because the VA interval is short, it's AV node reentry. Frankly, this alone is enough for me to go ablate. I wouldn't have to do any other maneuvers. I've already proved AV node dependence and a VA interval that's too short to be AV reentry. I'm often ready to ablate. Um, sometimes you get this in the lab and it's very frustrating. You know, you have a person who has tachycardia all the time, you get them in the lab and you know, just can't make it happen, right? You get a, a couple beats, three beats, you know, you can pour in your ISO epi and you still may not get it to happen. And sometimes that just happens. So then you have to use other things and say, well, every time I, in this particular patient, and by the way, that's almost always AV no reentry when that happens. So here's a patient that was just going like this, two, three extra uh, echo beats, nothing else. But just think about it. A down to the hiss, up to the A, the HA shortens a little bit, and the HA stays the same, and you always end with an A. Now, why should an atrial tack always end without conduction? That's, that's 
ridiculous to think that would happen. It can happen once or twice, but not every time. So if I got, and I remember this case, it was really a pain in the neck. This is all I could get, even though he had documented PSVT. And I went ahead and just took out the slow pathway area uh, and we got a success because you know, that's what this person has. This is not atrial attack. VA is too short to be AV and just go take care of business. I mean, try to get the full tachycardia so you can go through your maneuvers, but honestly, sometimes it is, just isn't working for you that day. Okay, so let's say now you've proven the AP nodes part of the circuit. Well, you, now you have another job. Is it a V reentry or is it AP node reentry? So, okay, first thing I do is I say, let me see if I can prove that the pathway is part of the circuit. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And they all involve is the ventricle part of, of the loop, is something in the ventricle. Remember, for those of you who think a junctional rhythm is, is, um, is superventricular, um, if it's his related, it's VT. I know you're never going to believe that for me, but the his is in the ventricle. And I know you're not going to want to hear that. And you're not going to ever tell me that a narrow complex his tachycardia is VT. And it's okay. I, I understand why you don't want to say that, but the his is a ventricular structure. And changes in the HV interval will only affect a, a arrhythmia that uses the ventricle as part of the circuit. So those are the things you have to remember. So this is the classic one, VA prolongation with ipsilateral bundle branch block. There's one exception to the rule. And at the end, we'll take questions and we'll see which, which uh, participant knows the one exception to that rule. But typically, VA prolongation with ipsilateral bundle branch block, HA prolongation when you increase the HV. Remember, HV is part of AVRT and only AVRT. Tachycardia terminates. I already showed you this one, right? With a PVC that occurs when the hiss is refractory and you don't go back to the A, and that's reproducible. That's always AVRT. Prolong the AA interval by a PVC when the hiss is refractory. That's these funny long RP tachycardias. Um, I will tell you that I've never seen this rule broken, but I can't tell you 100% this would be true. If you measure the VA pacing in the VA during tachycardia, it's less than 50 milliseconds in an adult. I would accept the fact you might get a kid that would break this rule. I have personally never seen this rule broken in 40 years of doing work with WPW. So this is one I use too. Again, we come back to my figure here, not mine, uh, Dirk Dora's figure. And by the way, for those of you who want to know a little history, uh, too bad we don't have fellows that I could just be querying here with uh, questions during the, during the lecture. But Dirk Dora, who was his aspiring young fellow? Hein Wellens. Hein Wellens trained with Dirk Dorr, wrote some of the classic papers in the early EP days in the 60s, even before his bundles were available. And as we all know, went on to phenomenal success as one of the uh, godfathers of uh, clinical EP. So again, remember the transeptal. So why is this important? Again, when w Dr. Klein and I worked on the pre-excitation index, I was trying to figure out a way to be sure we could tell our surgeons we we're on the right side of the heart or the left. Because the early surgical approach, at least the one that was pioneered by Celia Duke, was a very different approach if you had to go on full bypass or not. So it was really important for us to be sure we knew where our pathway was. And I remember using, looking at this paper and trying to figure out how can I use this physiology to help me. And again, I showed you the, the incremental pacing, but it's the same concept for a single PVC. And that's where we originally did our work. So this is a stylized diagram of AVRT with the going up a pathway, turning around, coming down the AV node, up a pathway, AV node. And then at some point, we, you put in a PVC and you start very late and you keep bringing them in until you have pre-excited the atrium. Now, if you're on the right side of the septum, you should get into that circuit pretty soon. So your pre-excitation index should be short. If you have to go transeptal, then it should be long. And that's what we found out. And that's where the pre-excitation index comes from. Later on, we did the incremental pacing, but initially uh, this was the idea we had. But it doesn't matter if one beat does it or 12 beats does it, it's the same physiology. So here's a lateral right atrium. This is not high-low. This is a mapping during uh, AVRT in the lab. And this was a, a lateral basal or RH um, uh, point. And you can see this is uh, a, right, a right free wall tachycardia with the right atrium first. 
we put in a PVC very late. Okay, 460 minus 425 is 35 milliseconds, and we bring in the A, so a pre-excitation index of 35 is going to put you on the septum or right free wall, and you know where you're going to have to go look for it. It was a concealed pathway, but you know you're not going to have to go on full bypass. So that's the pre-excitation index, and that's where the numbers came from. So basically, uh, if you're less 50 or less, you're on the right side of the septum. If you're greater than 75, you're on your free wall. And those numbers have held up fairly accurately. The in-between numbers can put you anywhere. Okay, so now let's take that bundle branch block that we were talking about. Um, if this is your normal circuit, okay, and you get a left bundle, then you now are going to the right side of the heart. Now you have to get back over here, right? You detour. And guess what? Your transeptal conduction time comes into play right here. Okay, so if you're measuring the, the V to A, then in this case, the V would be over here somewhere, and this would be the A, or here, wherever you want to measure it. But now the V is here, and you have to add all this extra conduction time to get back up to get the same A. So when you get a bundle branch block on the side of the accessory pathway, and the VA interval is longer with the bundle and shorter in normal, that shows you the, that that bundle is part of the circuit and nails down its AVRT. So here's an example that was interesting in this case because, frankly, I was surprised. Um, I thought I got this person. This person had a left free wall accessory pathway in the lateral position um, with the delta wave, and we were able to find it and get rid of it. And then, of course, I always retest, and I retested, and I induced this rhythm. So if you were in a lab and you saw this rhythm, okay, so here's the A's, right, coming up here. Uh, here. Here are the A's, and so it's coming up in the septum, which is also a pain in the butt. I didn't have a good hiss available at the time, but um, I thought, what, what is this now? Is this AV node reentry? Is it septal accessory pathway? Is it atrial attack? And so I said, okay, I have to start from scratch again. So I started putting in PVCs, and lo and behold, I, um, I peeled back the refractories to the left bundle, which we won't get into today. Um, and now I've turned it to a narrow tachycardia with the same activation sequence. And I thought, okay, well, that's cute. Let me make some measurements. And to my surprise, the VA interval with left bundle was 188 and was 136. And I have to tell you, I was sort of ticked off. How's that? Be the nicest way to put it on a lecture. Because, I, you know, I thought we already took care of that left free wall pathway. But the, the left free wall pathway was clearly eccentrically activated. So I looked at this and said, well, physiology, I have a term I always use with my trainees, physiology doesn't lie. You're really in trouble if you try to go against physiology. Because physiology, physiology doesn't care. Physiology is like this virus. While some of our politicians think it's, it's affecting Democrats and Republicans differently, you know a scientist that that's hogwash and you can't deny this change. So the left bundle is part of the circuit, period. Even though it looks like it's coming up to center, you just have to find it. So I will tell you a trick. Anytime you find, and I, this has held up pretty well for me over my career, whenever you find that the hiss and the distal CS are that close to each other um, and you have to find a pathway that's between the hiss and the distal CS. And that's almost always left anterior, uh, sort of on an LEO view would be basically one or two o'clock. Um, and I didn't show you that here. I didn't put that one in here, but I'll tell you, when you map this out, you would find in the left anterior septal space, sort of coming right at you, uh, the VA interval was like sort of right here. It was really early. And basically what it was doing was it was going across to the his bundle area almost the same time it took to get to the distal CS. So actually it looked like you were having a concentric activation pattern, but once you mapped, you found the actual accessory pathway. So it didn't lie. I mean, it was correct. And this one observation got me to get to where the pathway was because I actually thought for sure it was something in the septum until this happened. I mean, it just looks like a classic septum. So physiology doesn't lie when you find it, it's true, go look for it. Now, I also talked about the HA interval. So in this case, you can see 
Here we're starting tachycardia, we're pacing the V and we're starting tachycardia. And first of all, we get a VAV to start tachycardia. So you know it's either AV node reentry or AV reentry. And a couple of things here of interest. The VA during pacing is almost identical as the VA during tachycardia. Remember what I told you? That's not going to happen with AV node reentry. So you kind of already know you're dealing with a pathway. But then you get really lucky and you get a VA and you come down with a long H to V of 120, and then H to V starts to normalize, and then it finally did. So then you make them, then you say, okay, the HV is different, so let me measure the HAs. So the HA is 215 here. When you lose 50 milliseconds, you, it's not always exact, but you can see it's almost back to, to the same thing. So in other words, HA prolongation caused HA prolongation. Find the pathway, ablate it, and go have lunch, okay? Uh, because that's what it's going to be. And you know it's not going to be on the left side of the heart. It's going to be on the right side of the heart, 100%, or the septum, because of this relationship. So you know the HA differential proves it's part of the circuit. I will tell you, you should have already learned this from my previous uh, comments, the VA being almost the same during pacing and tachycardia tells you you're either in the septum or right free wall. Just map it out, find it, and get get done with business. We already showed this one. This is a, a tachycardia. Uh, this is the one that we, that we were looking for, by the way. This is the same pathway. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is a different patient. This was in the septum. I, I take it back. This one was actually in the septum, and we were sure if it was AV node reentry or AV reentry, and we put a PVC in when the hiss was refractory. We terminate tachycardia without going to the A. It's AV reentry. Find the pathway, get done with business, and go home. And here's the case of pushing something out. This is a very, very, very unusual tachycardia. I, I know you're going to look at this and say, was I drinking Kool-Aid that day? This is actually, this was a young kid. This was actually the AH interval during tachycardia. It was a very long VA and had a short AH, which you often see in kids, okay? And it actually can cause what's been called in some cases a pseudo-infarct pattern. I mean, if the, if the A is like right in front of the Q wave, you can often see in leads two and three and F, you get almost what looks like if the P wave is not in front of it, it, it almost looks like a little Q wave there. So there's a very late uh, P wave. And during tachycardia, we put in a PVC at the time of the hiss. Okay, the hiss, if you actually measure this, this is the A wave here. The hiss would have been right, right in here and we're smack on the hiss. And we push out the next day. So that's so-called post-excitation. That tells you the pathways involved and basically you just need to go look for it and get rid of it. So that's another proof that it's in a pathway mediated tachycardia. Okay, so let's say you got lazy and you decided, eh, I don't wanna go through all that. Let me see if I can just eliminate the pathway first. So the easiest way is the VA is too short. If the VA to the high rate atrium is less than 90 milliseconds or the VA at the base is less than 60, it's almost never accessory pathway in adults. Now, if the VA is zero, even in kids, it's, it's AV node reentry once you've established the AV nodes involved. And this is what you often see. So, you know, like I said, that becomes real easy like I showed you. But that's, that's not what often happens, right? You get these VA intervals that are 120 or 110, and you're just not sure, so you have to go through all your proofs. If you have even one beat dissociated during a VA dissociated, it's never AV reentry. If you have changes in the HV and they don't affect subsequent a HAs, it's not AV reentry. And remember, we talked about this, the one exception being if you have a funny long RP, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, uh, and this is just one I found to be useful. But again, uh, if you're greater than 75 milliseconds and you're in the septum, we have never personally seen that associated with an accessory pathway. So again, if you're not sure, you can try to eliminate the pathway. So if you, if you go through those, okay, if you go through these maneuvers, first of all, some of you might think it takes a lot of time. I will tell you, I've been lecturing for about 30, 35 minutes. I can do all those maneuvers in five to 10 minutes. I mean, this is not something that takes you an hour. You get some intact cardi, it stabilizes, you go through first do, if it's an SVT, always do ventricular stuff first. I mean, don't go pace in the atrium, that doesn't help you that much. So put in your, put in your PVC run, put in your incremental pacing run, 
stop and measure everything. And almost always, just by that alone, and showing if there's wobble in the initiation, you're home free, okay? You're home free. It doesn't take an hour to figure this out. But I will tell you this, sometimes you get really, really weird stuff. So when that happens, I go back to Sherlock Holmes. When I was a kid, it was one of my favorite things to read. I, I loved Sherlock Holmes and, and uh, read all of the work from Arthur Conan Doyle. And he said this, it's an old maxim of mine that when you've excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So what if you got this? This was a, a absolutely important patient to me. It was very early in my ablation career, probably, well, I don't know, maybe 1990 or something like that. I mean, we were, in, we were doing a lot of OR work before this. Um, and I got this patient. She was a young person. She was in her 20s. And she had a history of PSVT, but I get her in a lab and this is what I get. And it's like, are you kidding me? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, and she had a, uh, she had a, uh, what we affectionately call not a functional bundle branch block, but a fellow induced bundle branch block. So this is one of those fellow induced, a little too heavy on the hands in the uh, right, in the right bundle area. So there was, she didn't have this normally. She had a right bundle in, in, at the study and take a look at this part. So we've got more A's than V's, okay? More A's than V's. Can that possibly be AV reentry? No. I'm sorry, I mean, uh, yeah, AV reentry, no. You can't. You can't have more A's than V's for AV no reentry. Then look over on this side, at this point, A started dropping out. You kidding me? So if the A's are dropping out, then can't be atrial attack. Well, guess what, kids? You only got one thing left, and that's AV no reentry. And I had never seen something like this at this point. I um, mean, I've seen this again over the years with the thousands of these kind of patients I've had the, the privilege of, uh, of, of treating in the lab. But uh, this was the first time I saw this, and it totally changed the way I thought about AV no reentry. So, anyway, I'm seeing this patient. I figure it's got to be AV no reentry. I've done all of, all the of Sherlock Holmesian's uh, methodology, I've excluded the impossible. And whatever remains must be the truth. So I took the catheter, I placed it right outside the CS, and I put in a lesion there and everything terminated. And I couldn't even get anything again. And that was a seminal event for me in the lab because it took me from this concept that the AV node, I mean, that, 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 that you need to always have the atrium involved uh, out of my head. And I realized you can have AV dissociation and still get AV node, re, AV node reentry. And it, got me thinking about the posterior extensions of the AV node. It changed my way of thinking. And I actually think in a lot of these patients, it's the posterior extension to the posterior extension. Like the AV node has posterior horns. And I actually think in many such cases, it may actually be uh, the horns being involved in the circuit. And remember, one of the posterior horns does dip down right around where the CS is in the os. So if you ablate in that region, you're probably ablating that connection for AV no reentry. Uh, but anyway, this was the case that got me thinking away from the way I had thought previously. So what are some other maneuvers? This is one that was published uh, uh, by my partner. We, I mean, we co-published, but uh, Dr. Padanillum, I give him the credit for putting it all together. And this is the maneuver where, you know, you're in a lab and you've just done AV no reentry and you put some ISO in there. And now you've got this uh, 520 or 500 millisecond tachycardia. And you're not sure, is it AV no reentry? You got more work to do? Or is it just one of these junctional tachycardias? You put a PAC in, when the uh, his bundle is refractory and you see what happens to the next beat. If it's a junctional tachycardia, it will never move the next beat. If it's AV no reentry, you can often bring it in. And that's what's happening in this case here. So here's this tachycardia, you know, it's relatively slow, you know, about 125 or 30 a minute, something like that. And the VA interval is a, kind of short. There's a hiss in front of them. And you put in a PAC right on top of the hiss and you bring in the next hiss. So that rules out a automatic junctional rhythm um, and is gonna tell you that this is an AV no reentry. Now, there's gonna be at least one wise guy who's gonna say, well, how do you know this is an atrial tack over a slow pathway and all you've done is bring in the next one early? And you're right, it, but you have to remember there's more to measure. So. This is a longer AH, right? 
But if this AH is the same as this AH, then it means the AB node's part of the circuit. And guess what it is? So you got to measure more than one thing. I mean, you can make that argument. It hardly ever is true. But let's say you find the one patient where it is. So measure the AH and the HA. If you bring the AH in, okay, I'm sorry, you bring the HH in and you change the AH, but the HA stays the same. It's AB node dependent go ablate the, the area and get rid of the, the circuit. Now, how about these long RPs? Um, people get fascinated by a long RP tachycardia. I, and I have to admit in my early days when I was a youngin, I thought they were really cool. Wow, I'm gonna study a long RP. So what do you think is the most common cause of a long RP tachycardia? For those of you who said sinus tachycardia, you're right, the, mo the, the most common our long RP tachycardia is sinus tachycardia. So don't get too excited, okay? So any atrial tachycardia, for example, where the PR is shorter than the RP is one thing. And then you do have the fun things. And I admit they are fun and you gotta figure them out in the lab and we all get a kick out of it. And that's either a slow pathway or, or a slow conduction retrograde, a kind of a reverse loop, fast, slow, uh, as some people like to call it, AV no reentry. But don't get too excited. It's the same rules. You got to go through all the same things. It's just, you know, just take your time and go through your maneuvers. So here's a patient with a long RP tachycardia. You can see that here. So we get him in a lab and we pace the, the ventricle. And I can pre-excite the A, but not when the hiss is, is still there. So this is brought in a lot. This is a, a cycle length of 432. And I brought in the A, this next A, but it was over 140 milliseconds. So normally you'd say, okay, uh, that means it must be AV no reentry. But remember I told you that those rules do not hold up with long RP tachycardias. You can't use those rules. So if I use that rule here, I go ahead and try to go take out an AV no reentry. So this is where you can apply a couple other techniques that are very helpful. And one of them is called differential pacing. And I, I use this, this, is brought, this was uh, reported many, many years ago, and I've routinely used this for these kind of patients. So the, 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 the deal here is, is you're trying to figure out, is this coming up an accessory pathway to slow conduction or the AV node? Okay, so you place a catheter, and it's usually just a deflectible tip catheter used for ablation. And you know, here's the thing, so you're going to use the cat, you're going to ablate this anyway, you're going to use that catheter at some point. So just take it out, and it's easy to maneuver and you can get it back sort of in this post receptal area on the ventricle and keep your other one at the apex. Now, if a pathway's here, then you're gonna have a different response to differential pacing. So let's take a look at this closely. In a situation where there's no pathway, if you pace here, your VA, whether you measure it here or here, I don't care where you wanna measure it, is gonna be shorter than your VA here, correct? So if the VA during RV apical pacing is shorter than during post-receptal pacing, that would be no pathway. If on the other hand, you do have a pathway here, your catheter is closer to it. So your VA during post-receptal pacing is gonna be shorter than your VA during apical pacing. So in this patient that I was absolutely sure it was AV no reentry because I just was, and this just shows you how you can't, you can't fix your head in the lab. So this person was in was late 50s and was just starting having tachycardia. So how often does accessory pathway mediated tachycardia start in your late 50s? I mean, come on. And then you have a long RP and you're coming up that post-receptal sort of area. You know, you could argue it's a little leftward. Yeah, but that's not uncommon when you're coming up with a funny AV no reentry. It's not uncommon for the CSs to be slightly earlier. So I was just convinced that I was dealing with a, um, an, an AV no reentry that was a goofy one. But I figured I would well before I turn on the energy, let me be sure. So I paced the apex and it was 262. Then I paced the post receptum and it was 214. I went back and paced and paced and paced and paced because when you're sure you're right, and the data prove you wrong. You always like to think you did something wrong with the data and because surely you couldn't have been wrong, right? Well, I was wrong, but again, I didn't cause any harm in this patient because I didn't ablate till I was sure. And then if you're closer to the actual pathway, right? You can put in a very late PVC 
and terminate tachycardia on the His and prove it's part of the circuit. And this one turned out to be, um, I can't remember if it was, it was in the post receptum. I, it's too many years ago to remember if it was either on the left or right side. I can't remember now. I'm thinking it was on the left side, but just snuggled into the septum and we took care of business and got rid of it. So be, con be compulsive. Make sure you nail down a diagnosis before you ablate. Um, more recently, uh, Dr. Patanillum has uh, re-looked at this and we've rewritten this paper and gotten it published. And I like this because this is actually easier. Um, you know, it's something he was playing around with and we, we would talk about. And we said, well, wait a second, maybe we can, instead of doing all that moving catheters around, what if we just capture the his area? And it doesn't matter if you capture a little of the V too, because it's hard to go pure his pacing. But the thinking would be this. We know that if you can capture the his with a very late PVC and you have AV node, uh, you have uh, AV reentry, you're going to get into the circuit, right? Because it's part of the V. You're going to get in. But a very early uh, uh, his extrasystole, and again, it's not really his. It's 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 it could be his or parahisian. It usually is parahisian. Uh, is not going to get into an AV node reentry circuit because it's a micro reentry, and you're just going to extinguish yourself. So that's a study that was done. And the bottom line is, if you can if you can uh, shorten AVRT within a 20 millisecond index, okay? That only occurs with AVRT. I mean, you can bring in, uh, you can bring in AV node reentry circuit also, but it usually requires a longer one. So it's not 100% that you'll do this, but most cases you do. And let me show you how you apply that then. So here's a different patient we studied that had, a, well, it's not, it's not as long an RP, but it's one of these in between. And I know you're going to hear the term from my, my former trainee, Sonny Jackman, for those of you who didn't know he trained with me, uh, a term that I never use. I do not use slow, slow. Sonny likes that term. I don't. Slow is a speed. Okay. It's not a circuit. Slow is a speed. So you don't know. I mean, you can have 150 and 150. Is that slow? I mean, you can have a 300 millisecond tachycardia where the, the AH and HA are equal. So I, I try to avoid those terms. And I just put this into a lump that I call intermediate variety tachycardias because you really don't know what it is. It's not these real early VAs that you're sitting in here or the real late ones. And I just don't try to characterize them by speed. I characterize them by location. So in this case, I wasn't sure what it was. And you put in this, uh, this premature hiss uh, and you capture, you can see it's, it's not exact, right? So this one is more almost hiss, but it's still the PVC is also capturing some ventricle. This is the first one that brought in the A, okay? But the cycle length's 444. It required us a lot of prematurity to do that. You'll never see that with AVRT. This is clearly AV node reentry. Just go to your usual site, ablate, and go home. I'll just end with this. Uh, one last maneuver and then take some questions. Uh, it's important that you understand this maneuver because it'll really nail down for you any of these ARTs you're thinking about, whether it be atrial fascicular reentry or a, 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 anadromic reciprocating tachycardia. This is the schematic. So you have, and we'll use a left-sided pathway since there are most of them as as the schematic. If this is the circuit you're looking for, you're you're seeing a pre-excited tachycardia with a a one-to-one -one AV relationship. And what you have to rule out in that case is, is the pathway a participant in tachycardia? Or is it just a bystander? For example, if it's coming up the, the septum where this is normally the issue, it could be an atrial tachycardia with conduction over an accessory pathway. It could be AV node reentry with conduction over an accessory pathway. And it's your job to prove if the pathway is part of the circuit. So what you want to do is put a late PAC in. Remember, the rule is narrow complex tachycardia is you do ventricle maneuvers. That'll give you the answer. Wide complex tachycardia is you always start with atrial maneuvers because the differential is pre-excited, aberrancy, and VT. Now, you should never, you should never mix up aberrancy with either one of those because the HV interval is normal. So that should never be an issue, except Brad's going to say, okay, Eric, but what about bundle branch reentry? Well, if you have a trouble figuring out if bundle branch reentry is an SVT or a VT, you got other problems to worry about. So it's really not usually a problem. So your biggest thing is to try to say, can I prove this is ART? 
a link PAC, and then you track it around. So let's let's watch that. So here's a wide complex tachycardia, obviously not aberrancy. Just look at the 12 lead. VT or pre-excited. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, and there's even something fun here, which I'll go over, but it isn't the main thrust. You actually have a late hiss here. But the point is you position in the CS out where you think the pathway, this, if it's a pathway, it might be, it's a left free wall, let's say. You put PACs in late and you keep bringing them in until you perturb the circuit. So here's a, here's a late PAC and you put it in a time, it's very important, where the AA interval in the septum has not been disturbed. That's critically important. So it has to be a late PAC. Then you notice that you bring in the V and you check the morphology, it's identical. VT is out. So now you know you have an accessory pathway for anterograde conduction, but do you have a RT or is it bystander? Well, then you have more measurements to make. Now you measure the V back up to the A, and if you can pre-excite the AA interval here, then you know atrial tack is ruled out because you didn't, the only way you can bring this AA in here is if you had perturbed this A for atrial tack. Since you didn't disturb this one, there's no reason for this one to come in. So AT is out, VT is out. The only other thing is, could this be AV no reentry? Well, a late PVC will never pre-excite AV no reentry, okay? If you put in PVCs during AV no reentry, you never, remember the pre-excitation index, it's always over 100. So a late PVC never brings in AV no reentry. So you know for a fact you don't have AV no reentry, so game, set, match, take out the accessory pathway and go home. So I'm gonna stop at that point. It's a lot of information over a short period of time, but I'm happy to take questions from anybody if you have some. Um, so. Um, that was great. Thanks so much. Um, there are a few questions that have come through. If anyone else has others, go ahead and either put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, since, mo since most things are AVNRT, is there a reason to start with PVCs on the HIS or should you just go straight to ventricular overdrive pacing? Um, very good point. Most likely you'll have a catheter in the right ventricle. I mean, most studies, right? So why move catheters around? Just to take advantage of what you got. So if the VA interval is zero, all right, then you know it's not an accessory pathway. The only thing you have to worry about now is ruling out atrial tack, right? Because it's not going to be, so may, you can from that very first view in the lab, kind of know where you're headed. But no, I wouldn't do the uh, premature hiss. In fact, to be honest with you, I don't do them for most cases unless they're long RPs. They're extremely useful for a long RP because you don't have to be moving a bunch of catheters around, right? If you have a long RP and you can capture the circuit with a late, P, uh, late hiss capture, then it rules out AV node reentry, right? It, it rules in AV reentry. But if it's a routine one, I don't even bother. I just really go straight to the PVCs. Okay. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, I guess a couple scenarios that people are struggling with. So um, you have uh, documented PSVT, but all you get in the lab is dual AV nodal physiology. How comfortable are you doing an empiric slow pathway? You kind of touched on that. And what's your endpoint in a case like that? Okay, that's a great question. And um, I wish I could have some deniability on this because uh, I know somebody will tweet this as soon as I'm done with this session. But I'll be up, I'll be up front and fess up what I've done in my career. The first time this happened to me was probably 25 to 30 years ago. It was in the early days of AV node reentry. Not in the very earliest days where we were just trying to, I mean, you have to remember, we couldn't measure. I don't know if Brad, you're younger than I, Brad, so I'm not sure exactly when you got in, but were you in the days when we couldn't even measure impedance and temperature or any of that? I mean, all you can measure really was the watts going on in the very earliest days. So it wasn't then, but shortly thereafter, I had a few patients that were PSVTs, and in the lab, I couldn't get anything except duels. And I didn't do anything with them, to be honest. But then there was a, a, a couple years after that, in the early 90s still, uh, we opened up, uh, we were asked to do a, you know, a, uh, they asked me to, uh, an old dookie, 
was in South Bend, Indiana, and he asked me if I would come up there and do EP studies. And that's, that's a pretty far distance from Indianapolis, I mean, to be doing that as an outreach. So I made a deal that we'd, uh, I would fly up there in a small plane. <laughs> this is just a Prostowski thing. And then I would spend the day there, they'd have a car for me, and then they'd take me back to the airport and I'd go home. Um, and here's what I learned. I had two or three patients that I easily induced into AV no reentry up there. I went through all my maneuvers, proved it, but no one wanted, I didn't want to do ablations up there. They weren't set up for it. So we brought them back to Indy. And guess what? One or two of those patients, I couldn't start anything in the lab. I mean, nothing. And, and I knew for a fact they were AV no reentry. So I went ahead and ablated those. But that's like, you could say, okay, big deal. You knew that. And what was my end point? My end point was just starting low and just keep working up. I wasn't a big cryo fan. I still not actually. Just keep putting lesions in, but pacing the A so I could track the AH until I saw AH lengthen and then I stopped. And they did very well. And then guess what? Then I got a similar case, just de novo. Patient with PSVT, brought him in the lab. All they had was duels. And I didn't actually want to tell anybody I did this. So I actually did several of them and they did well. I kept my mouth shut because I thought someone would string me up. And then Carl Heinz Cook actually presented a small series of those. And I thought, oh good, I'm not the only nut in the world. You know, but so I, then I started telling people what I did. So I still do that to this day. It, but I, I demand a documented PSVT. I don't do it on palpitations. I want to see that PSVT and I've had my eyeballs on it. I know it's consistent with AV no reentry and it wasn't like a flutter or something. If I know that going into the lab, Nishan, then I'm comfortable ablating if I do something or not. And I always tell patients now in my initial discussion with them, we may not start something in the lab, but based on your tracing, I will probably do the following. And then what I do is I start low, just like I said, and I make sure I get junctionals and I'll continue to move up, keep going north, and when I get a little close, I'll start the atrial pacing and track. And if I see any, any um, prolongation of AH at that point, I call it a day. And I can tell you that there have been a few exceptions to this, but almost all of them are cured. But, but I demand, it's very important to remember, I demand that an eyeball, your trained eyeball on that ECG, not somebody saying they had PSVT. I won't do that. Okay, great. And then uh, there's a question here you mentioned, Dr. Jackman. He puts a lot of emphasis on, you know, multiple areas where there are slow pathways, rightward inferior extension, leftward inferior extension, et cetera. How relevant do you think those things are, given the fact that most of us just go to the one area and ablate? <laughs> so now Sonny will be on my case, because I guarantee you someone's going to tell him. Um, so Sonny and I have had this discussion. Sonny gets super technical and super you know, mapping, you know, Sonny, he'll spend six hours mapping something. And I, I just don't have the, the uh, I don't have the constitution for that. I will tell you that nobody in the world knows the exact pathway for AV no reentry. And anybody who says they do are lying. Okay. There's no anatomic proof of pathway. If you ever look at the early anatomy studies and you go to Hill Yancey's beautiful work on AV node microelectrode work, there's no pathways in there. It's a whirl of tissue and there's atrial, uh, atrial tissue overlying the uh, AV node. Um, those are beautiful papers to look at decades ago. So this isn't, we draw stick diagrams like we know what we're talking about. I happen to agree with Sonny but it's really based not on Sonny's work, it's based on the anatomy that was brought up by Becker years ago when I showed you those posterior extensions. Well, one of those extensions are on the left. You know, when Sonny talks about the circuit coming back on the left, he may be right. I don't think there is a pathway there. I think it's part of the extensions that we know ride the right and left side of the septum. But I'll tell you, no matter how you cut the cake, there's a sweet spot. You can map all that out you want, and in fact, in the recent, I think uh, the recent meeting we were in, you know, not this year, past year, but a year ago in, in uh, December, in the, the course in uh, Chicago that uh, the Vivek uh, Reddy, that, uh, not Vivek, but um, uh, David Wilbur and, uh, and Sra run, you know, the old ACTAR course, that one of Sonny's former trainees showed this wonderful case and they paced from here and they paced from there. And, and I'm, on the, I'm on the panel, right? They paced from here and I stopped her and I said, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to find the earliest stim to A and where the circuit is. 
She said, what would you do? I said, I'd take the catheter, I'd put it right under the os, and I'd turn on the energy because it's AV no reentry. And I don't care where you paste from, there's a common pathway that goes there. I've done 4,500 of these and I've rarely missed. So I said, what did you do? So she ablated initially somewhere in the CS where she thought it was closest. I said, how'd that turn out? She said, well, I didn't get it. I said, what'd you do next? She said, what you did. <laughs> I right. said, did it work? She said, yeah. So George Klein loves to call it the sweet spot. And he's right. You know, I mean, you know, George is. I mean, George says, just stop being an ass. Just go to the sweet spot and get done with business. Because the truth of the matter is, is we didn't know this. It's not like Prostowski knew this 30 years ago when I started doing it, but two years of experience with tough pathways with like that one I showed you, A's fall out. I mean, what the hell's going on there, right? But but I figured, what do I have to lose ablating around the os? That's the furthest away from the node that I could think of. Uh, and guess what? It works. So I will tell you, you can do all that stuff Sonny's doing. It's highly academic. I give him a lot of credit for doing it. Or you can take the Prostowski approach. Is once you've identified it's AV node reentry, take the catheter, put it in the CS, let it drop right outside the CS, start in that area. You want an AV relationship of about, you know, I, I usually like three to three or five to one, you know, small A, nice B, make sure you're on the annulus and make your first burn. Or if you like cryo, I know uh, Brad loves cryo, make your first cryo. Um, you'll, you'll win, right? I mean, come on, Brad, you'll win in what? No, I don't use I need focal 9%. cryo. I don't use uh, focal cryo at all. Oh, I thought you were the cryo guy. Cryo, we well, do a lot of cryo balloon, but we don't do focal cryo for SVT. If I oh. could respond to a couple of comments. Um, first of all, you said I was old, but then you took it back, so I'm happy you said that because well, because I'm old. Really you're you're younger. But I was in the mid '90s. We were doing pre-temperature control. We were titrating the power to get an impedance drop. And once you got a 10 ohm impedance drop, you were happy, but you get these coags and char formation with these big uh, uh, jumps in the impedance. Um, and then just to, to comment on another point you raised, uh, the ABIM, David Haynes took over as chair of the committee. Oh, okay. We left him with a great, great group. And as you know, the committee that writes the board questions really tries to stay out of the politics of decisions the ABIM makes. So. I had no input in the MOC decisions or anything like that. <laughs> I definitely want to say that. <laughs> um, can you go, uh, can I just go over a slide with you? Because I yeah, went through pretty quickly. The, the, the first VAAV slide, so maybe like between 15 and 20, after your ladder oh. diagram, you showed an uh, atrial tachycardia. After oh, the atrial tach. Oh, hold on, let me get that for you. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I've seen some, some people... One? This one, Brad? Yes. Okay, so go I've ahead. I've seen some of these terminate and then restart with a retrograde double fire. And I didn't have time to look at this carefully, but it almost looks like your AA gets short and then it gets long. And then you end with what looks like a VAAV, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's a, a it goes up to, because your VA, uh, if you can just kind of walk over from left to right, the AA here, sure. and then it's probably the same the next interval. Yeah, there is wobble in the tachycardia circuit, so you've got a good point. It was then it gets short, it gets short, and then it gets long. And yeah, I, there's I wobble. You, there's definitely wobble. But then at the end, you've got a VA. Why would that be shorter? Why? Well, see, I thought. You're right. See, that this is maybe not the best example to show, but it happened to be in the slide deck, so I did. Yeah, I just wonder um, if you terminated a, a long RP tachycardia and reinitiated it with well, a great double right. fire. Just so, so let me explain what Brad's saying, because I don't think everyone's thinking. I know what you're saying, but I just want to make sure yeah. other people know. This is always a problem, right? So in other words, how do you know for a fact you don't have a double fire? What if I'm going up here and also the slope? Right, yeah. and that's really what you're saying. And we, and we had a case recently, that's why I raised it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think if you look in, in sinus rhythm, I mean, in tachycardia, you can see that the A, high rate A is right on the hiss. So it would be pretty unusual for AV node reentry to have a higher rate at the same yeah. timing as the hiss. Yeah. So, um, but while I totally agree with you, you have to be sure you don't have a double firing. Um, this was so long ago, I can't really quote yeah. you chapter and verse. I knew this was an atrial attack uh, and it had wobble. So this is really, for all the reasons you're saying, this is probably not my best example to show tonight. 
Um, but it's clearly not AB no reentry. Uh, uh, there's wobble here. If the high high RA and the hiss are equal to each other, um, but uh, your point's well taken. So it's yet one more question in the lab, right? So if you you have to be sure you're not getting a double fire. So we already right. showed. Make sure you didn't terminate it and reinitiate. Right, exactly. We already showed this one being a fooler, which right, is right. one you got to right. watch out for. And I I totally agree with you there. Uh, not my best example to show. You're probably right. That's all right. I just saw it quickly, and I didn't want to interrupt you. So no, no it's Thanks. a very good point. I, I will say this though. You know, everyone talks about this double firing. Um, I I do this routinely in every patient, and I can't remember any case that I'm. I mean, you you probably have one, but it's pretty damn uncommon to have yeah. a double fire. We, I've even published a case, but we did have a case a month ago, and you can right, get- Right, but you admit, if you published the case, it was probably very- yeah, You can get uncommon. a VAV, you can get a VAV, or you can terminate it and reinduce it with a- Right, so, so, the, so I think the, the nice part about this discussion that Brad's bringing up, and Brad obviously is, I was teasing him before, he'll like some of the slides, he loves these, because he published it. <laughs> I mean, I, the, looking at all these, sort of the PPIs and things. Um, uh, I never got into the PPIs because I, I always found it easier, Brad, just to look at the VA differential. But the PPI is obviously a good measurement to use. It brings up the point that you should just do all your maneuvers. So, like I said, I don't stop with one maneuver uh, unless it's dead on like that one. I mean, if you have a, a VAV that's 20 millisecond differential and an HV lengthening, HV runs the HA, I mean, I don't have to do anything else. There, you're home free. But it doesn't take more than five or 10 minutes to run through all the maneuvers. And I didn't mention one. I don't know if you were involved in this one because I didn't want to get into the weeds, but uh, I know Fred published it. You may have been the first author. I don't remember. I thought it was kind of nice. In an atrial, trying to figure out septal atrial tax, if you pace the A and measure the AV interval, or you, and you compare that to the same AV interval during tachycardia, Right? Do you remember that yeah. paper? It was Ching, Ching Man published the Delta okay. AH. Yeah. And I think it was 40 milliseconds, if I remember it correctly. Less than 40 was uh, probably AV no reentry. Greater than 40 or 40 or greater was an atrial attack or something like that, if I remember right. Uh, right. But so that's another one you can use. The thing is, know all your maneuvers, take the 10 or 15 minutes to do them, and then go ablate. Because here's the problem that most people get into especially younger EPs, you know, they, they do, they, they jump too quickly and then they don't get a success with the first, second or third energy applications. And then they start questioning their diagnosis. You never should do that. You should never question your diagnosis. You should nail down your diagnosis and then question your ablation technique. Okay. But you shouldn't start saying, right, because otherwise you're chasing your tail. So if you just nail down the mechanism um, some AV no reentries, their AV no reentries are either easy as crap or they are the worst thing in the world. I mean, I've had some, I've been in the lab hours before I could finally get a success. And it's like, I never was sure why I got a success. I mean, all the things were going along as they should have, junctional runs, good temperature, good impedance drop. And then it comes back and you do it again and it comes back. And then you just find this one area, almost like on the screen, you can't even tell it's a different area, right? You put an energy in there and boom, you're done. So it's a tricky area um, and you have to have your wits about you, but you shouldn't start to say, oh, maybe it was an atrial attack. Maybe I made a mistake. That's the worst thing to do. Nail your diagnosis and then just be secure with your ablation. 